OK, so I'm going to um, hand it over. We our presenters this evening are Dr. Sylvia Asa and Dr. Shireen Izat from Toronto. And in the interest of time, I'm going to um, pass it over to them right away. We will take your questions um, if you can populate them in the question box, uh, but we won't get to them until after the presentation is over, which I understand is probably an hour give or take. So Sylvia, uh, Dr. Sylvia Asa and Dr. Shireen Izat, over to you. Thank you very much, Jackie, and thanks to everybody who's giving up a wonderful evening just before Christmas to learn all about rectal nets. So um, Dr. Izat and I are going to share this presentation, and I'm going to start. For those of you who don't know me, I am a pathologist. A pathologist is a doctor who uh, looks at biopsies and surgical specimens and blood samples and cells and so on to try and understand disease and give a diagnosis to a patient so that somebody like Dr. Izat then knows how to treat that patient. So I'm going to start off with um, a background on, uh oh, now my screen is frozen. <laughs> um, let's see what we can do, there we go. Um, so I'm going to start off first with some goals and objectives, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, us, just in terms of disclosures, because as you well know, with all medical professionals, we have to do our disclosures. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to clarify for you some data about the incidence of rectal nets, that's called epidemiology. We're going to define and describe the kinds of rectal neuroendocrine tumors that exist, that's the classification of these tumors. We're going to work to help you understand the features that can identify and distinguish slow growing tumors from the more aggressive tumors. And we're going to help you hopefully to understand some of the therapeutic conundrums that we face when we're trying to decide how to manage any patient who has a rectal neuroendocrine tumor. And one of the features that we're not gonna discuss clearly, but I think you'll appreciate from the way we're doing the presentation, is that care of any patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor requires a team. And we try to build clinical teams that involve pathologists, endocrinologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, all the different kinds of doctors who are involved in managing patients who have these diseases. In the case of rectal nets, gastroenterologists are usually involved early on because they're usually the people who uh, identify some of these tumors. So um, before I get into the actual discussion, and I will start with more of the biology as background, um, Dr. Izat and I do have to make disclosures so that you understand that we may have some biases. Uh, as a pathologist, I'm involved in two companies that do pathology imaging. My, my uh, involvement in those have no conflicts with what I'm showing tonight. Dr. Izat is a medical advisor for a number of companies, and those of you who are patients and getting drugs will recognize the names of some of these companies. They all do make drugs for neuroendocrine tumors, um, but he hopefully is not biased because he works with all of them. So I'd like to start now by giving you a background about neuroendocrine tumors in general and try to clarify some terminology issues so that you will know as you go through your journey what these words mean. So very recently, I was lucky to work with an international group, and there's a quotation at the bottom of this slide that's the citation of a paper that we just published to try and come up with a comprehensive approach to classifying all neuroendocrine neoplasms. Neoplasms are tumors that proliferate and we've classified the entire group as neoplasms so that we can sequester specific words to use to imply a kind of neoplasm and rectal nets fall into this category because they are epithelial tumors that arise in the rectum. Epithelium is a kind of tissue and most neuroendocrine tumors are epithelial. And there are two different kinds of tumors within the epithelial category. There are the well-differentiated ones and poorly differentiated ones, which are much more aggressive. And so the WHO framework that we're going to adhere to from now on, I hope, is to use the terminology neuroendocrine tumor as a well-differentiated 
example of a neuroendocrine neoplasm. And we're going to use the terminology neuroendocrine carcinoma for a poorly differentiated, more aggressive neoplasm, no matter where it arises in the epithelium. Now, I've just made a note here that there are some other non-epithelial neuroendocrine neoplasms, and those are mainly paragangliomas, and they can occur anywhere in the body even potentially in the rectum, although that's not a site where we very often would see these. So I'm really gonna be restricting my discussion to the epithelial category tonight. But I do wanna put this in the context of the whole body, just to remind you that rectal nets really share many characteristics with other neuroendocrine tumors that occur everywhere from the brain to the tail. So in the brain, just underneath the brain, we have pituitary tumors, which are nets. In the thyroid, we can have nets. The parathyroids can have nets, pancreas, small bowel. The small bowel is actually the major site where most people talk about carcinoid tumors and carcinoid syndrome. Um, but that's really um, a misnomer, and I hope as we start using the new terminology, it will go away. But as you can see, there are tumors that can occur everywhere. On the right side of the slide, there are some very rare ones that occur in the pelvis. And I listed those specifically because they can be confused for rectal neuroendocrine tumors. Some patients will have a net begin in a gonad or in their bladder or prostate or cervix, depending if you're male or female. And those tumors can mimic a rectal neuroendocrine tumor. And that's why it's so important to have a pathologist make the correct diagnosis. So we're gonna focus on rectum and I'm showing you here a picture and on the right of the screen, I think you can see my pointer moving. This is just a very high power picture showing the very top of the epithelium that's lining the normal rectum. This is what we call normal rectal mucosa and it has in it endocrine cells that are scattered among exocrine cells and the endocrine ones are the ones that you can see in this beautiful red color because they've been identified by an antigen antibody reaction that gives red color, showing how these cells actually live singly, scattered among the more numerous cells that give rise to other kinds of tumors like regular colorectal cancers, which we call adenocarcinomas. These cells can be stained with a number of different markers, the less specific ones are synaptophysin and chromogranin, but chromogranin is a very useful marker and that's actually what this stain is, because it tells us that the tumor is making a substance which we know is secreted into the bloodstream and can be measured. And some of you who have neuroendocrine tumors will know that one of the tests we do regularly is to measure your circulating chromogranin levels as a reflection of what's being made by the tumor. These tumors also can make hormones, and I'm not gonna go through this list now because I wanna show you some more slides so that you'll understand the importance of all these different hormones. Now, this is a really old slide, and I know it doesn't look very fancy, but it's actually, it dates me a little bit because this is a slide from 1984 when I was a very young trainee in pathology. I was studying endocrine pathology, and I went to a meeting in Sweden, and the Scandinavians have been real leaders in this field as far back as the 1980s, as you can see. They had mapped out the presence of hormones throughout the entire bowel. And each of these lines is a different hormone that can be recognized using the same kind of stain that I just showed you, showing where each of these hormones is made. So you can see, for example, somatostatin is much more common higher up in the bowel, whereas glucagon is very common in the rectum. This is serotonin, which is the main thing that we think about when we talk about carcinoid syndrome. And this is actually the population of endocrine cells. And you can see that the most number of endocrine cells per unit of, of mucosa is actually in the duodenum. But look at the rectum is actually very, very highly enriched with endocrine cells as well. So that gives us kind of an idea of why some hormones would not be made by rectal nets because they're not in those cells but it also should tell us a little bit about the distribution of the cells that give rise to tumors and why they're so common in the rectum. This is another map showing the same kind of picture, but again, focusing specifically on the rectum, we can see glucagon, serotonin, pancreatic polypeptide, and oops, sorry, and peptide YY, 
and I'm going to talk a little bit about these because these are the kinds of biomarkers that a pathologist uses to actually describe what kind of tumor we're dealing with. And it has clinical implications because it will di distinguish the kind of symptoms that a patient can have. The interesting thing about endocrine tumors that's different from other adenocarcinomas is that these tumors not only grow, but they also make hormones. So their impact can be local from growth, but it also can be because of hormone secretion. So here we are now at the rectal net. And this is actually a picture on the right of a biopsy of a rectal neuroendocrine tumor. It's been cut in half, which is why you can see these two faces of this tumor. And I think for it's pretty easy for you to imagine that somebody who would have a tumor growing in their mucosa will have a polyp sticking up because the mucosa would be flat normally. But as these cells grow, it for, they form a polyp which sticks up. And that's what we usually see when a person has a colonoscopy and a rectal tumor is identified and it's biopsied, and the person doing the endoscopy will burn the bottom of the polyp. You can see there's some very dark marks at the bottom, which is where the tissue's been burned. And they remove this polyp, and they send it to pathology. In many, most instances, they don't know that it's a neuroendocrine tumor at the time of the biopsy. So we receive these polyps, and there are many other forms of polyps that we look at. Some of them are completely benign. Some of them can be adenocarcinomas. But in this case, there's a very characteristic appearance of a solid nesting tumor that is very typical for a neuroendocrine tumor. And here you can see on higher power, th this is the mucosa that I showed you in that first slide where the normal endocrine cells live. And here you can see these nests of tumor cells that have started right up at the top. And what they've done is they've proliferated and they've started to grow down and they're invading through the wall of the bowel and getting to the bottom of this polyp. And for us, one of the things we look at is, are they at the bottom or did the person who did this biopsy remove the entire tumor? In this case, it looks like it's pretty clean. We can see tumor cells, but the resection margin looks like it might be free of tumor. And that's one of the jobs of the pathologist is to look at multiple sections and look for any tumor cells that are invading. Here, I'm going to higher power, higher magnification so that you can see this is the epithelium. These are these endocrine cells that budded off initially from these normal crypts and they've started to create these tumors that are solid nests infiltrating and forming long ribbons of tumors that are go tumor cells that are infiltrating through the bowel wall. Now the interesting thing about endocrine tumors is that they actually look reasonably unaggressive. If this were an adenocarcinoma, the cells would look a lot wilder. They'd be darker and the nuclei of the cells would be bigger and darker and ugly. These tumors, the reason they were called carcinoid originally is that carcinoid means carcinoma-like because the person, uh, uh, a pathologist named Dr. Obendorfer who described these tumors thought they were benign because the cells look so bland, but they infiltrate the bowel wall like a cancer would. So he called them cancer-like tumors. Here again, you can see how these cells infiltrate through. This is the, the pink stuff is the normal tissue. The tumor cells are infiltrating through the normal tissue, but they don't look really ugly. They just look like they're busy growing and infiltrating, and that's exactly what they do. Now, as I told you, when we get these biopsies, these tumors can come from many other places. Sometimes they'll be adenocarcinomas. Sometimes they'll be um, not endocrine tumors of other types. Sometimes they'll be endocrine tumors that start in the bowel, but sometimes they might be endocrine tumors that might be coming from somewhere else, like an ovary or a bladder or even somewhere else in the body, and that's what we call metastasis. And so pathologists have worked for many years to develop a number of biomarkers that can tell us what is a tumor making? Where is it coming from? What kind of tumor is it? And I mentioned synaptophysin and chromogranin as biomarkers of neuroendocrine tumors. On this slide, I'm showing you a long list of uh, what we call transcription factors that tell us where in the body a neuroendocrine tumor is coming from. And as you can see, each part of the body has its own unique profile of transcription factors. So the rectum is actually interesting 
because it often doesn't even have a transcription factor. But if it has one, the transcription factor it expresses would be CDX2, which is present in the small and large bowel to some extent. The presence of any of these other biomarkers would tell us that this tumor is coming from somewhere else, not from the rectum. But fortunately, we have a different marker in the rectum, which I'll show you in a few minutes. There are also some other cytoplasmic biomarkers, and actually this is the one I promised to tell you about. In lung and pancreas and GI tract, we have keratins. In thyroid, we have an enzyme called carcinoembryonic antigen. In the pelvis, specifically in the rectum, we have an enzyme called PSAP, prostate-specific um, acid phosphatase. Sorry. And this PSAP is a biomarker that is expressed only in neuroendocrine tumors of the large bowel and the rectum, and that can help us to identify those tumors. And as I said, paragangliomas, which can occur almost anywhere in the body, have their own very specific biomarker, which is uh, tyrosine hydroxylase. So pathologists go through this thought process whenever we're looking at tumors to try and identify where is it from, what kind of tumor is it. And in the case of a neuroendocrine tumor, we want to know what hormones these tumors are making. And as you can see, there are many, many, many hormones listed on this slide. They don't really matter in this instance, but I wanted you to gather, to get a feel for the kinds of testing that we can do so we can pinpoint exactly what kind of tumor and what kind of hormone that tumor is making. So we will know what symptoms a patient will have from hormone excess. So here is that same neuroendocrine tumor of the rectum. This happens to be a very well differentiated tumor. As you can see, it's very nicely positive for PSAP, which is brown. That means that this is a rectal tumor. It's negative for some of the other markers, so it's not coming from lung or somewhere else. This particular one is negative for serotonin, and it's positive for three hormones, PYY, PP, and glucagon. PP stands for pancreatic polypeptide. PYY is peptide YY, a very imaginative name. I don't know why, why it was called YY, but it doesn't matter. As you can see, these cells are positive for these particular hormones. Now that actually tells us, that's, that was PYY in the previous one. This is PP, another nice hormone being expressed by these tumors. This immunoprofile tells us that this is a very specific kind of tumor called an L-cell tumor of the rectum. Now, for those of you who are patients who have NETS, you will know that in some institutions, as soon as you have a diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumor, your doctor's gonna start asking for urinary 5-HIAA levels, which you will have to collect 24-hour urines, take them to the lab, and they will measure your 5-HIAA to see if your levels are high or low. Are they going up? Are they going down? After you've had surgery, have they dropped to normal? And that's all wonderful if the tumor is making serotonin because 5-HIAA is a breakdown product of serotonin. But in this case, this tumor was completely negative for serotonin. So in this case, I would tell Dr. Izet, in this case, you don't need to measure 5-HIAA. If you wanna measure something, you can measure PSAP because that is a biomarker we can measure in the circulation or PP or PYY. Now in contrast, some patients do have rectal nets that are what we call EC cell nets. And those tumors are usually positive for CDX2 and they are positive for serotonin. And if this patient has a, a, a tumor that needs surveillance, that would be the scenario where we would want to measure 5-HIA in the urine. So I would encourage you as patients, because I know I've spoken to patients who have had clinicians who ask them to keep doing this test and it's always normal and they get frustrated because it's not easy to collect 24 hour urines. It's a pain to have to carry that bottle around with you for a whole day. Um, and so we would want you to be involved enough to ask, do I really need this test? Is this the right test for me? And if it's not, why are we doing it? Now there's one more kind of tumor that I wanna show you that occurs in the rectum and this is the neuroendocrine carcinoma. If you remember at the very beginning, I said there are well differentiated tumors, the common ones in the rectum that are well differentiated would be the EC cell and the L cell tumors. But occasionally we see a very nasty looking tumor which is made up of much smaller cells that don't form a nice pattern. You can see they're just solid nests. At the top here, this is all dead material, which pathologists call necrosis. 
So that's not a good thing. You would not want to have necrosis in your pathology report. These tumor cells are also positive for chromogranin and synaptophysin. So this is a neuroendocrine neoplasm. And I'm sorry, that's wrong. That should be a NEN, a neuroendocrine neoplasm. But this one is a NEC, a neuroendocrine carcinoma. It's also positive for keratins, so it is epithelial. In this case, a tumor that's positive for TTF1 would not be reliably indicating origin from lung because we know that neuroendocrine carcinomas can express transcription factors that don't belong even where they come from. And a tumor like this usually is going to be negative for hormones because these are very aggressive, rapidly proliferating tumors that are busy multiplying instead of doing their job of making hormones. Now, I wanted to just make one more comment about the pathologist's assessment of a rectal net. And as I said, most of the time we get biopsies. And when we get a biopsy, one of our jobs is to look at the resection margin. Now, I'm going to show you a series of photographs to show you the difficulty that we face when we cannot see what's been left behind. So when a biopsy is done, the surgeon snips this off, they burn the edge so it doesn't bleed, they send it to us, we look at it, we think it's clear. I'm showing you here a similar picture from another tumor, and in this case, the tumor cells are stained brown. However, if you had a deeper look at that, you would see that there are some tumor cells that actually got away and are lower down through the wall of the bowel. And if you read your pathology reports, you're going to know that they talk about invasion through the mucosa. And there's a thing called the muscularis mucosae here. But then there's a thing called the muscularis propria, which is the main muscle of the bowel wall. And this tumor has gotten into that muscle. And if we only had a superficial biopsy that took just that tip off, we wouldn't know what was left behind. And in this particular case, I happen to have the entire thickness of this biopsy. And by the way, this is not rectum, it's higher up in the bowel, but it's a very nice illustration to show you the challenge. In this case, the tumor went all the way through the wall and is actually even involving the very deepest margin of the bowel wall. So we only know what we see and we don't always see what's left behind. And that's why every biopsy can only be interpreted in light of exactly what the pathologist has received and is able to say. And so you as patients have to understand that sometimes there are other techniques that are used to investigate what we have not been able to look at in your pathology. And on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Izak because he then will see the patient and decide how he's going to pursue their further management. So, Shireen. Okay, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Um, so this is just to uh, show you where uh, rectal neuroendocrine tumor incidence is. Um, this is over the decades, and, and really the important thing to emphasize is that um, neuroendocrine tumors are not just about the small bowel. Uh, there is, in fact, an increase in lung neuroendocrine tumors, and as you can see in green, the rectal neuronic tumors is on the rise quite significantly. And, and this is something that has to be kept in mind. So this is not just an off um, phenomenon. Uh, this is a study that actually looked specifically in patients who are undergoing colonoscopies for other reasons. So these are patients uh, in whom the procedure was being done for the base, on the basis of age. And what they identified were 180 rectal neuroendocrine tumors. And what he tried to analyze was what were the factors that determined whether somebody is going by chance turn out to have a rectal neuroendocrine tumor. And here's what they found to be significant. Uh, this is the odds ratio, which means the chances of being more than just uh, random. If you've had a previous history of cancer, any cancer, you are at threefold increased risk of developing and finding a rectal neuronic tumor. Secondly, if you happen to have high lipids, high triglycerides in the blood, you also are at increased risk. If you happen to be diabetic or uh, having impaired glucose tolerance, interestingly, that's also a risk factor. And having a higher value of CA, which is a marker, interestingly, that's used for colon cancer and other types of non-endocrine cancers, that also is a risk factor. And finally, age. So the important thing here really to appreciate is that aging 
glucose intolerance and the so-called uh, metabolic syndrome are potentially risk factors for neuroendocrine tumor detection. And they're fairly commonly identified at the time when someone is having a colonoscopy for other reasons. The general view is that it's uh, one in 100,000. Most are relatively small, being under one centimeter and fairly localized. And of course, uh, metastases or the risk of them being uh, badly behaving depends on the size, atypia, grade, and as Sylvia mentioned, the depth of invasion. And this is a very, very critical piece of information. And I have to emphasize this point again, just because somebody has a three millimeter neuroendocrine tumor does not mean that that was all of a tumor. It's not unusual for the biopsy sample to be three millimeters, but I wanna know that this really was the whole thing and that there isn't a lot more of that tumor that's left behind or possibly may have been discarded by accident. And the reason for that is the management is gonna require anything from device-assisted endoscopic mucosal resection, submucosal resection, transanal surgery, or even oncological surgery that is much more involving, and that's typically for larger tumors where there is lymph nodal involvement and invasion. So you want to tailor the treatment just right, and doing too much or too little can potentially be quite disastrous. So again, the low risk neuroendocrine tumors of the rectum tend to be relatively small, but you have to be certain of the size, not of the specimen, but that you have to go back with the person who first detected it and know really what the overall size of a lesion was. The pathology, as Dr. Asa has mentioned, is very, very important. You uh, all know about the KI-67, and you also need to know that the nodes were looked for and were in fact negative, because that is the kind of patient who is gonna do well with minimally invasive procedures as compared to somebody who's got much more extensive disease that's more invasive, who's gonna require a much bigger operation that carries with it a lot more morbidity. And that gets me to the question, how do we know about the nodes? Well, this is one of the things that uh, all of you probably have been hearing about. This is a gallium. 68 scan coupled not with a CT, but a gallium with MRI. And you can see here in the rectum, this is a primary tumor. And of course, up here are multiple other positive lymph nodes. So even though this was a relatively small tumor, this is a patient who clearly had much more extensive disease and is gonna need more than just a local resection of this. They're gonna require a much more extensive operation. So knowing beforehand, the extent of disease is very, very critical in tailoring the treatment and specifically the type of surgery. What causes these things in the first place? Well, it's interesting. Uh, we now know a fair bit about what causes pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, even small bowel neuroendocrine tumors. But the interesting thing is that colorectal neuroendocrine tumors, which are relatively different, do not carry the same mutations. And that's a very, very important finding. And in fact, in a study that um, uh, we performed uh, recently with Dr. Califano in New York, uh, this just shows you the genetic events in pancreatic, small bowel, and col colorectal tumors. You can see uh, just from a way they segregate is that they're very different beasts. These are very different types of tumors. And what it's telling us is that the drugs that we're gonna need to use are probably gonna be different. And it's probably also telling us something else, which I think is very important. And that is, what is the role of the environment in bringing out genetic abnormalities that then result in an actual disease and a tumor? And it's quite likely that the rise in colorectal tumors is a response to something that is in our environment, whether it's something that we eat or something else that's in our diet, it's clearly very different from what happens in the small bowel and from the pancreas. So stay tuned as we get to know a lot more about how these tumors are critically different in their underlying basis. So again, to uh, not to belabor the point, but uh, I, I like to divide uh, neuroendocrine tumors basically into low risk, again, less than one centimeter, well differentiated, and have an L cell, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, low KI-67, and specifically, I want to see a report that says 
no lymphatic involvement, no vascular invasion, and no perineural invasion. If the report does not mention these features, whether they're absent or present, that report is useless. And that report needs to be challenged because you need to go back and ask, have these features been looked at and were they present or absent? The same applies to lymph nodes. If there's no mention of lymph nodes, whether the nodes are affected or not is meaningless if nodes were not examined. Why? Because in the high risk group, the tumor is not only larger, it's not of the L cell type, it has a high KI67 and often will include one, if not more, of the lymphatic, vascular, or perineural, meaning invasion into the nerves that supply that area, as well as the presence of lymph nodes. Clearly a very different disease, very different treatment as compared to the low risk ones. Um, again, I wanna show you the slide for a couple of reasons. First of all, we all know about G1, G2, and G3, and this is showing you survival of neuroendocrine tumors of the rectum. In blue is the five years, in green is the 10 year survival. And you can see here, if it's a G1, survival is excellent. G2 goes down, G3 goes down further. But the important thing is that if you look at lymph nodes, again, you can see that if the lymph nodes are negative, survival is much better than if the lymph nodes were positive. Now, if you account for these already existing and known features, and if you add on top of it now the L cell type, regardless of the grade, you can see that if you happen to have an L cell type, you do much better with survival of almost 90% as compared to almost 50% when it's a non-L cell type. So again, it's emphasizing something which is very important. It's not just a matter of size and nodes and invasion, but the type of cell is also critically important in knowing how well that patient is going to um, behave and again emphasizes how far we need to go with our treatment to prevent these type of outcomes. Uh, laparoscopic procedures are widely available. Typically they're used for very small tumors, typically under one centimeter uh, when it's very low in the rectum and often it has the advantage of preserving anal function and this is just one study that shows exactly that with a survival in three years that's showing almost 80% of patients doing quite well. So selecting the right procedure for the right patient with the right information is so critical. Uh, I already told you about the uh, gallium 68 as being uh, a scan that is used to detect disease, uh, but it also allows us to be able to detect uh, the density of the receptors so that potentially we can tailor the treatment which is uh, shown here on this slide. If we can detect the disease and find it in only one area, then obviously surgery is the most logical and it's likely to be curative. Debulking is when we know that the disease is there, but we can't remove all of it. And sometimes we use radiofrequency ablation or RFA embolization, especially for disease that's in one area such as the liver. When it gets into bones and the bones become affected in a manner that potentially can compromise the structure of the joint or is associated with pain, then we use irradiation. And I have to indicate that also one part of radiation, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, is peptide radioreceptor therapy or PRT. But also medical therapies are available and this includes rectal neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, the staging of rectal neuroendocrine tumors involves the so-called TNM system which again includes the size of the primary tumor, the presence or absence of nodal metastases and distant metastases. Chemotherapies uh, generally are not very well um, uh, studied in rectal neuronic tumors. Here are response rates in pancreatic and so-called small bowel, as you can see the response rates in general to classic chemotherapeutic agents is not the greatest. However, more recently, when we started to look at uh, studies such as the clarinet, it, it, that, it did include some patients with rectal neuronic tumors, as well as radiant 4, which used everolimus or affinator, indicating that somatostatin analogs, as well as everolimus, are potentially useful drugs to use in patients with rectal neuronic tumors. CAPTEM, you've all heard about, 
is the combination of capecitabine and temozolomide, two orally administered chemotherapeutic agents. It works well in patients with high-grade disease that is not um, amenable to surgery and has evaded other less toxic therapies. Um, this type of uh, CAPTEM um, uh, treatment has been around now for uh, almost a decade. The response rates have uh, been actually reasonably good compared to um, other types of therapies. And as you can see, uh, in uh, more than half of patients, we can see either a partial response or stabilization of disease. I want to emphasize peptide radioreceptor therapy has been studied in small bowel, and you've all heard of a so-called Netter-1 study where it showed that survival and disease progression were in fact improved by PRT, and overall survival was also improved, but all of these patients were small bowel neuronic tumor patients. These were mid-gut, relatively mid-grade or low-grade, not the high-grade, and certainly did not include any of the rectal neuronic tumors. So we really don't have good PRT data on rectal neuronic tumors. We do know that uh, PRT can be personalized, and if a patient has the opportunity to gain access to a clinical trial, uh, where as shown here with dosimetry, then they probably have a good chance at uh, being tested for uh, the possibility of using this type of treatment. So again, the factors that influence what drug or what therapy to, uh, to choose from depends on the type of tumor, the stage, the grade, the extent of metastases, whether it's functional or not, the patient's performance status is absolutely crucial. We always want patients to get treated earlier before they start to become malnourished, weak, and fatigued. Um, they need to be given all of the options right up front so that they're aware of the sequences that are available to them. And that ultimately, it's going to be a combination of medical, surgical, and probably internal radiation, a form of PRT that's going to do the best job possible for most patients. I'm, I just want to end with a couple of slides that are sort of more schematic uh, to keep things in perspective. Specifically for rectal neuronic tumors, if they're relatively small and they don't show any abnormal features on histology, then these are patients that will have laparoscopic, uh, what we call endoscopic submucosal dissection. That allows for a very simple procedure in the hands of somebody who's very experienced. If a tumor is between 0.5 to 2 centimeters, we also want to do more examinations, including endoscopic ultrasound to make sure there's no disease beyond what we think is present, and MRI. And depending on the presence or absence of invasion, we then will determine whether they're going to have a minimally invasive procedure versus one where there is evidence of invasion. And that's where more studies are required because if in fact there is more disease outside of the area that we believe is present, that patient is likely going to require multi-systemic therapies and not just a simple operation like those patients with small, well-contained disease. So again, personalized approach requires full information of the extent of disease and knowing the degree to which it has invaded into the layers of the bowel. The follow-up becomes another challenge, and this is something that I'm sure many of you have, have heard and have had to endure, and you probably have received uh, very different types of recommendations, but I'm gonna try and summarize them here. Stage one disease, less than a centimeter, low grade, then probably an annual endoscopy is appropriate. Not a scan, but endoscopy, so that the patient is subjected to the same procedure that probably detected the tumor in the first place. If it's a little bit more of an intermediate, then you're gonna want an endoscopy as well as an MRI, probably on an annual basis, again, for five years. If it's more than two centimeters, then this patient is probably gonna require annual endoscopy and ultrasound and MRI. Remember, this is not an ultrasound from the abdomen, this is endoscopic ultrasound, so they actually put the scope with an ultrasound at the other end. Very, very important, EUS it's called. Um, if it happens to be not associated with a uh, relatively high grade, uh, then perhaps annually for five years would be appropriate. Patients who have stage two or three disease 
are going to require, in addition, imaging of the chest and abdomen and pelvis, in addition to everything else that I mentioned. And obviously, stage four disease, those patients who have widely metastatic disease, they're going to require imaging of the entire body and will need to be followed for at least 10 years, um, indicating that there's a high likelihood of these patients relapsing, not just in the first five years, but in the next five years as well. So the take home messages here are that neuroendocrine tumors of the pelvis are very important. They uh, represent an important differential diagnosis in any patient who has disease within the pelvis. The pathology is so crucial in identifying the disease to make sure that it's not a metastasis that's going into the pelvis, but rather that this is disease really arising from the pelvis. And, and the rectum is a very important uh, site. You want the correct diagnosis. You want to have all of the elements that will give you the proper prognosis to predict exactly what's going to happen as best as you can so you can tailor treatment that is most appropriate, not too much, not too little. And importantly, this will also allow for the classification of disease that allows us to be able to determine who needs to be followed. As I said, some patients need scans, some patients need ultrasounds, some patients need endoscopies. And ultimately, the management of these patients is going to depend on all of these factors, which have to be done and have to be done right so that you know what you've got and more importantly, what you don't have so you don't have to worry about it too much. So I'm going to uh, pause at this point and I'm going to turn it over to Jackie, who will start looking at our questions and perhaps we'll entertain some um, discussion here. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Asa and Dr. Rizat. That was incredibly informative. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions at this point. Uh, the first one is, is the rate of rectal nets more prevalent when intestinal nets are the primary? Um, no, um, the, uh, the increased incidence of rectal nets applies to any type of cancer. So if, ha if you've had any type of solid cancer, you're at increased risk of a rectal neuronicotumor, tumor, not necessarily just small bowel. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through some questions here. Just bear with me for a moment. No problem. What are the most common symptoms of rectal nets? Mm -hmm. Are they any different than um, other neuroendocrine tumors? So the most common is um, that they will have no symptoms at all until they grow to a point where they can cause bleeding. Um, and sometimes people can confuse them for hemorrhoids. And it's really only when the patient undergoes endoscopy and it's visualized and possibly biopsied that you get to know it, what it really is. Um, they do not typically present like small bowel with hormone excess to the point where they have serotonin features of flushing, wheezing, and diarrhea. They tend much more commonly to present with local effects uh, which, as I said, typically would be either nothing or just some local irritation uh, with bleeding that would uh, hopefully bring the attention um, of uh, the gastroenterologist to do an endoscopy. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, what is the role of F18, FDG, in rectal net follow-up if there's no gallium-68 available? Okay, so people can follow. Uh, so FDG PET or glucose PET is a type of PET scan where you're using just glucose itself. It takes advantage of any type of cancer that is very, very aggressive and growing very quickly. Any type of cancer that grows very quickly above and beyond. So typically there are ones where the KI-67 is very high, well over 75, maybe even over 95%. Those type of cancers tend to take up glucose very quickly and therefore will have a positive FDG PET. It is not specific in any way. It is the type of scan that we do in order to determine just how aggressive the disease is, but it doesn't tell us that it's specifically neuroendocrine tumor. Okay. So what do you think is the um, reason for the increase uh, uh -huh. in of rectal um, that's a very good question. There are two uh, schools of thought. Some people say, well, there are more patients having endoscopies and that's why they're being detected more frequently. 
I somewhat disagree with that because the campaigns for colorectal disease started almost 30 years ago. Um, and the recommendations of people having colonoscopies after the age of 50 have been present for decades. So I don't think that's really the answer. I am more of a believer that there is something in our diet. There is something that passes through and makes contact with the rectum and the body's ability to try and defend and respond to that stimulus is sometimes overwhelming to the point that it turns into a tumor. If you think about it, that's precisely what happens with small bowels as well. It's an area where contents of the large bowel go into the small bowel, and that's called the ileocecal junction. And that's another area where a, a theory has been that a bacterial growth that typically resides in the colon gets into the small bowel. And that's why that particular junction shows a predilection. Uh, from what I showed you on the genetics, I suspect that rectal neuronic tumors are genetically different, but in response to something in our diet, that, that the interaction between the two is what's causing more of these tumors to become uh, increasingly detectable. Hmm. It's very interesting. So do you think that um, if someone has had uh, a case of a rectal net that's been removed and you talked about um, being followed depending on the, you know, the size and, and the grade um, for, you know, up to five years. So is there a chance that someone could get another rectal net in future beyond that five year period? Do we have any? Um, exactly. Like um, yeah, that's a very good question, Jackie. I think you're right on there. Um, I, I think one of the reasons why the recommendations are to keep scoping such patients. And uh, again, I want to emphasize, let's not go overboard because sometimes I see people getting scoped every three months, for example. I mean, that, that's crazy. Unless there's something really unusual, uh, you don't want to be scoped that often. Um, but uh, being scoped every six to 12 months for five years is quite appropriate, precisely for the reason you mentioned. It's not so much that the disease is coming back, but it is likely that it's reoccurring because mm -hmm. we don't know what caused it in the first place, but we know that this person is predisposed to develop them. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Do are most um, rectal neuroendocrine patients or are any um, prescribed um, somatostatin analogs? Uh, yes, as I uh, showed you before, if um, the disease cannot be cured surgically, um, and then the answer is yes, uh, somatostatin analogs uh, can have a role, uh, but these are usually patients in whom surgery is not sufficient or not possible, uh, and uh, more importantly, that they are relatively low grade. Remember, somatostatin analogs are really relatively weak as compared to some of the other drugs that we have, but they're quite appropriate for low grade disease, what we call G1 disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please send them in. Uh, at this point, I think I only have one more. Um, mentioning about the genetic landscape for nets, can you please explain more about this and how you can extrapolate those findings in different parts of the world? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so when we talk about genetic landscapes, we're basically, we're talking about all of our chromosomal material and and we look at each chromosome and we say which part of our chromosomes have been affected and is there a pattern in other words if you were to put together patients with one type of neuronic tumor do they start to show a consistent theme depending on the type of neuronic tumor and that's really what we're seeing now we're not seeing pancreas and small bowel and rectal being all together, we're seeing them being very different. And that's what I meant really by different pathways. Um, that's number one. And number two, what's gonna be important is comparing, uh, for example, uh, different diets and seeing whether different diets have different interactions with different genetic abnormalities in order to, for us to ultimately be doing what I think we should be focusing on, and that is prevention. Detecting people who are at risk and preventing the disease from happening. That's ultimately what we're after. 
If I can just add to that, if, if you think about the genetic alterations, for example, um, pancreatic tumors are often associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. Rectal tumors don't seem to be associated with that familial disease. So that's a, a kind of an example of why we think these are very different because uh, even if you, have, if you don't have multiple endocrine neoplasia in your family, people who have pancreatic endocrine tumors, neuroendocrine tumors will often have MEN mutations in their tumors. So the same gene is implicated whether you inherit it or environmentally or sporadically it gets altered. Rectal tumors don't have those same patterns of mutations that we see in the other sites. And the same small bowel is also very different. It has a gene called P27, which is what's implicated in those tumors. Again, not changed in rectal tumors. So as Dr. Izat said, there are very different factors that underlie the developments of these different kinds of tumors. Okay. So we have another question about um, scanning. So uh, gallium-68 scans, do they always detect nets anywhere in the body, including the rectum? Uh, yes, a gallium-68 scan uh, will pick up wherever neuroendocrine tumors are present, um, whether it's in the uh, rectum. Uh, the value specifically of the gallium-68 in rectal patients would be to determine if any lymph nodes escape detection by CT or MRI, which I think is crucial if somebody's going to be having an operation because there's no point in doing a very big operation that has somebody losing uh, their anal uh, function, for example, or at risk of losing it, uh, knowing that the disease is uh, much more widespread than was previously anticipated. Okay. So we have another question about um, somatostatin analog, but specifically lanreotide. Uh, this person wants to know if it's if the injection is helpful for stage four rectal nets. Uh, so stage four, by definition, is where the disease is widely metastatic. Um, now, the important thing, though, is some patients can have widely metastatic disease, but it's slow in its progression, in which case somatostatin would be potentially worthwhile. However, if it is stage four, but more um, moderate or rapid in its progression, in other words, if it's of a higher grade, then that patient probably would not be appropriately treated with somatostatin analog and will likely need one of the other therapies that we talked about. Okay. So this is um, from a GI NETS patient. They want to know if they should be having regular colonoscopy testing for rectal NETS. Um, so, uh, depending on the size and the depth of penetration, as I mentioned before, um, then the colonoscopy would be part of the procedure. Because remember, the, the endoscopy starts all the way from the rectum and it goes right through and into the large bowel. So the answer is yes, it may very well be appropriate and it would be ideal if it is done by the same individual so that they know what they're looking for where the uh, previous pathology was and be on the lookout for uh, recurrences. Mm -hmm. So we have a general question that's not really specific to uh, rectal nets, but it's uh, the question is, is the gallium 68 available in all provinces of Canada? Um, the gallium 68 is now emerging as um, an imaging technique in uh, some centers in Canada. As many of you probably know, um, it is part of uh, an investigative trials in uh, provinces of uh, Quebec and, and Ontario. And I believe um, that out west in um, Alberta and British Columbia, they are in the process of setting up. I'm not sure if actually they've started. Um, but I know that the intent is to do so. Um, the, the problem with the gallium-68 is the following, is the short half-life of the material itself requires that it be prepared on site. Uh, so it's not something you can just simply buy, like the lutetium, which uh, uh, a commercial source can send you. Uh, this is something that you actually have to invest on preparing uh, within your own province 
And that's part of a problem that we have right now is to make sure that everybody is on board and hopefully there can be equal access across the provinces and across the country. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Okay, well, I don't see any other questions. I'll give a last shout out for anyone who has any final questions. If you want to send them in, um, that would be great. Otherwise, we will uh, wrap this session up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Izat and Dr. Asa, for your time in sharing this extremely informative uh, talk with us. Uh, let me just take... Thank you, Jackie, and, and thank you, Rico, for setting this up for us. My pleasure. Okay, sorry, there are actually a couple more questions <laughs> that have just come in. Um, if you've got a couple more minutes. Sure. Uh, this one says, do you consider SUV value for the diagnosis rectal net by gallium-68 DOTA scan? And if yes, is there any cutoff value you have? Right. So uh, the SUV is a measure of the intensity uh, of uptake. Um, and obviously, the higher it is, the better. Um, in particular, we generally like to uh, divide them into what's called a Krenning score of one, two, three, four. Um, and we like to see at least a score of three to four in order to make it potentially of value in terms of uh, giving uh, PRRT. Um, the, uh, the, the scores beyond that don't really help us in terms of uh, setting up other therapies, though, such as surgery. So even if you have a, a low score or a low SUV, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's negative. It just simply means that PRT is not going to be as uh, likely to do what it's supposed to do. Okay. So we did get um, a clarification question from the individual who asked about lanreotide. Um, right. They said by stage four they were uh, referring to metastasis to the liver, but right. lower grade, and they're getting a lanreotide injection, and they want to know how much it's going to potentially help. Uh, as I mentioned before, it, so that's really where we talk about three elements. Um, it, really, what it comes down to at the end of the day, stage everybody knows about. Stage meaning how far of a disease is gone. Grade is the grade of a disease, meaning how likely it is to behave or misbehave. So that's what we call G1, G2, G3. But really, at the end of the day, what we're always looking for is what we call rate of progression. In other words, how fast? It's like a car on the highway. How fast is it really going? If it's relatively slow, then somatostatin is good. So I, I say somatostatin for slow. But if it's more progressive, more rapidly progressive, either to a moderate degree or a high degree, then somatostatin analogs would not be appropriate. Okay. So one last question, would a CT computed eth ethnography detect a rectal net? Uh, so the CT entogram is basically a form of study where uh, it's designed to visualize the small bowel. It is not dedicated for the rectum and the rectum is best visualized endoscopically by putting the scope in and looking from the inside out rather than scans that rely on looking from the outside in. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think that wraps it up. There's no more questions. I would ask, uh, I'm not sure Dr. Zat and Dr. Ace, if you would agree if anybody has any questions after the fact that comes to their minds, if they wanted to send them in to us, uh, and perhaps we could share them with you and you could provide us with some input and then we could um, send them out by email or or something like that um, to the community if, you know, if, that's, uh, if you're agreeable. I, I know you've sure. already dedicated a lot of time to us. So um, thank you again for joining us and for your uh, very informative presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending. I'm going to wrap up. Happy holidays, everyone. Yes, happy holidays. Thank you. Same to you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.